So I love this song for two reasons. Well, let's not kid myself. I actually love this song for more than two reasons, but I'm only going to tell you two reasons this morning. So the first one is that it really gives us permission to acknowledge the times when we are not okay. And as we've been talking about over these last few weeks, when it comes to mental health, we have to be honest. We have to start being honest and encouraging ourselves to stand in the truth of where we really are. And sometimes those places are really great and we get to say, yes, I really am okay. But then there are the other times where we have to maybe lower the mask down and admit the hard truth that we're not always okay. And when we get honest about where we are when we find ourselves on our cycle or where we are on the mental health spectrum, whether we are thriving or surviving, we get to start figuring out what it means to live a thriving and abundant life. And so the second thing is, is that it really reminds us that the church, our church family, should be a safe place, a safe place to come and be honest That no matter what we're going through, we have a body of people who get to walk alongside of us 
And that means to cultivate that, we have to create an environment of talking about the hard things. And that's really what we've been doing over these last few weeks. We've been talking about the hard things when it comes to mental health. And sometimes we don't even really understand them all the time. And so as we've been kind of talking about the hard things and getting honest with ourselves, we have had to do some really hard work. We've had to be honest about what our mental health triggers are. We've had to get honest about where we find ourselves on the cycle. And we've had to get honest about the choices that we make when we have a mental health trigger. And so this week, we are going to really maybe take a little bit of a detour. You know, last week we talked about some practical tools that we can use when we are feeling triggered. And what those really do is they help give us the opportunity to change our trajectory. And sometimes it's not enough just to know, like, why we need to do something. It's nice sometimes to figure out, like, why we get stuck where we get stuck. And so that's what we're going to talk about this week. Um, because we're going to learn a couple things. We're going to learn more about why our brains kind of do the things that they do. We're going to kind of call this concept why they're hardwired for some things that we tend to find ourselves falling into. And then we're going to talk about what it means to rewire those hardwires. And as we do that, we are going to look at some tools and some brain science together of how do we begin to rewire those hardwires. Because while we know and we can acknowledge and we can stand here and be honest and say, I'm not okay, we also know that we don't want to stay not okay when we find ourselves there. We want to move to a place of being a little bit more okay. And the reason we want to do that is because we we know that Jesus cares about all of who we are, and that means he also cares about our mental health as well. And so when we find ourselves on the spectrum, that mental health spectrum that we've looked at over the last couple weeks, regardless of where we fall, we know that what we believe and what we think really starts to drive that unhealthy cycle. And so what we're saying there is that kind of what we think and believe starts to influence what we do. And so why then do we continue to do the things that we don't want to do? Why do we do the things that continue to hurt ourselves and hurt other people? Why do we do the things that are unhealthy for us? And why do we find it so hard to change. And so, you know, Paul, he asks some similar questions in Romans. And so that's where we're gonna, we're gonna be this morning is in, in Romans. And so we're gonna start out in Romans 7, verse 15. And Paul, Paul asks these questions in a little bit different of a way. And so starting in 15, he says this. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Do you guys like, do you hear that kind of similar thinking there? And then he goes on to say in verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And so you guys, there's a lot to unpack here. And we're not going to unpack all of it. We're going to kind of camp in just a couple places. And really what that is, is that Paul is talking about how even the believers, I mean, Paul is a devout believer. He is a devout Christian, a devout Christ follower. And he is saying that even he, even we struggle as we seek to obey God. And we find ourselves constantly in that tension. And in this passage, what Paul is doing is he is really portraying the frustration 
of the human condition. And he's not excusing behavior here. So when you read this, like, don't, don't think of those old images, right? Like, of, like, the angel and the devil on your shoulder. And then when you have a choice to make, you look, and you're like, oh, well, the devil made me do it, <laughs> right? He's not saying that. He's not excusing behavior. But what he is doing is he is reminding the, us that as humans, we are by nature bent away from God, and we are bent towards those things that are not from God, Kind of think of that lower cycle again. And since we are being honest and we're creating that environment of honesty, any time that we are coping in unhealthy ways, numbing the pain, landing in shame and isolation, and camping out in untrue beliefs, we are doing so in a way that is not from God. We're bending away from what God has for us. And so, how many of you have ever asked yourself why you do the things that you don't want to do? I mean, I'm I'm there. And it's almost, almost like you are unable to do the right thing even when you want to. And, you know, we see this a lot come up around, like, January 1st, (laughs) the New Year's. (laughs) Yeah, some of you know where I'm going with this, right? We might tell ourselves that this is the year that I am going to eat healthy and work out every day. Or you might tell yourself things like, I'm going to quit smoking, or drinking, or both. Or this year, this is the year that every morning when I wake up, I'm going to read my Bible first thing before I do anything. Or maybe for some it's a little bit deeper and it's, I'm not going to lie anymore. Or I'm not going to allow what other people think about me to influence my value. Or this one might resonate with some people. I am done with social media, but for real this time. Right? Or my favorite one, Nate will laugh at this one, but um, my favorite one I say all the time is, you know, I'm going to start on Monday. Fresh week, new start. Right? We have every intention of doing the right thing, and yet we don't. And so this is because over time, we hardwire our brains to respond in certain ways, to believe certain things, and it's through this thinking and belief combined with the action that we put behind it that we begin to live when we find ourselves triggered by one of our mental health struggles. And so how do our brains become hardwired? And more importantly, how do we move to a place of rewiring what has been hardwired? Well, we have actually been moving that direction this whole time. You just didn't know it. And the next couple weeks, we are really going to look at integrating some spiritual practices with these practical tools to help solidify some of those rewires. But what happens is our brains have what we call neural pathways inside of them. And these neural pathways connect one part of our brain to the other part. And then it starts to send signals to our body in how to respond to any given situation. And so every thought that we have produces this neurochemical. And then that thought, when combined with an action behind it, our brains literally begin to redesign themselves around that thought and action combination, and then this new neural pathway is formed. So an easier way for you to maybe think about this is like thinking about it like a rut. So when you're driving on kind of an uneven terrain, your car will naturally fall into the ruts of the cars that have driven that same path over and over and over again. And it seems like no matter what you do to kind of get your car out of the ruts and onto like the smoother road, you still continue to find yourself driving in those same ruts. Well, our brains are the same way. Those pathways that are formed are kind of like the ruts in the road. They're the ruts that we naturally start to fall into. And so some people, they think of these ruts as kind of like autopilot, but really what they are is they're the pathways that we make that our brains start to pull us into. And even when we have a different path we want to take, we find it incredibly challenging to veer outside of those ruts. 
So about eight months ago, our family, we moved. We moved from Ridgefield to La Center. And over the span of those eight months, I cannot begin to tell you how many times I have driven from my house to the church. We established last week that math is not my strong suit, and so I'm not even going to try to calculate it out, but it is a lot of times, a lot of times that I've gone from La Center here to Ridgefield. And like most people in this area, we venture outside of Ridgefield for most of our needs, and we find ourselves typically in Vancouver, particularly the same in Creek area. And so over the last eight months, it's an embarrassing large amount of number, a large amount of number, embarrassingly large, how many times I have been driving to Salmon Creek for something, and I find myself going around the roundabout near Rosars here in Ridgefield. I like take the roundabout, I'm like, wait a second, this isn't where I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be in Vancouver, and yet I find myself in Ridgefield. Well, that is because all of the times I have thought about driving to the church from my house, and I have driven to the church from my house so many times, my brain begins to form these pathways, these ruts that sometimes take me to Ridgefield when I should be somewhere else. It's almost like I don't have to think about what I'm doing before I do it. And you may have seen these same hard wires in yourself. It's why you might sometimes commit to stop arguing with your spouse and then continue to argue. It's why I am supposed to be in Vancouver, but I find myself at Rosar's driving the roundabout, right? It's why we worry nonstop, even though we know that it's not good for us. It won't change things, and honestly, it makes us feel a little bit sick. It's why you might freak out because your credit card bill is so high, and yet you continue to make the same unnecessary purchases, It's why we scroll on our phone for hours, not talking or engaging with our spouse or our kids who are sitting just a few feet away. And it's why, even though we want to make healthier choices for ourselves and we're committed to doing it, it's why we find ourselves reaching for the soda or the chips or the candy bars when we find ourselves unsettled. Doctors have found that it can be estimated that about 90% of the decisions we make on a daily basis are what they would call unconscious in nature. And that shows you that the pull into those ruts are very, very strong. And it tells us that these ruts that we create lead us into living in cycles. And these ruts, they start to influence us in what we choose to do. And the good thing is, is that these good ruts, these good pathways, they lead to really good and beautiful things like waking up in the morning, right? We wake up in the morning and we practice our healthy routines. We eat healthy food. We drink water. We go for walks. We look both ways before we cross the road. All really, really good things. But living through our hardwired brains, it has a dark side too. And that's what we've seen over the last few weeks as we've been talking about that lower cycle. We continue to live reactively and repetitively participating in old patterns rather than proactively creating new ones. The way we think and what we believe influences what we do. And so the good news is, is that just like God created our bodies to heal and fight off illness and infection, he's created the same thing for our brains. He's created our brains to be able to change as well. And this is good news for us because it means that over time we can begin to rewire what we've hardwired ourselves to do. So The scientists, the doctors, they call this idea neuroplasticity. And so neuro means literally the brain, of the brain. And plasticity means that it can be changed because it's malleable and moldable. And so while we may not have direct control over our mental health triggers, we can begin to change the way we think and we believe 
which in turn helps our brain reform over time. And so this can actually be particularly hard if your neural pathways are created and hardwired due to past trauma, clinical mental health diagnosis, or addiction. But the good news is if that is the case for you, you don't have to struggle and try to figure out how to do it alone. We actually, here at the church, we have a care team who is trained to be able to help walk you through some of those things. And more importantly, they have the resources to plug you in with a really good counselor. And what those counselors get to do is they get to help you identify the neural pathways that need to be changed. And then they get to help give you the tools and the support you need to make those changes. And so it's a really good tool to have. Because as we know that regardless of where we fall on the spectrum, wherever our triggers are, wherever our neuro pathways are, it doesn't mean that we can't live the abundant life that Jesus has for us. God created our minds to be wonderful gifts. In fact, in the Bible, the words mind, think, believe, and other variations of those words show up over 580 times. We, we read things like in Colossians 3.2 that tell us to set our minds on things above. We read in Philippians 4.8, when he tells us to think about the things that are true, noble, right, and pure, whatever is lovely, excellent, praiseworthy, admirable, if anything is excellent, you know, think of such things. We're told in Romans 12 too, that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, we read this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Those cycles, they can be broken. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish those strongholds, those cycles. We demolish arguments and every pretensions that set itself up against the knowledge of God. We can take those untrue beliefs and hold them up to God. Because when we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, we get to stand firm in the truth that he has for us. Remember Paul, all of those do's and don't do's and why do I do the things I don't want to do but not the things I want to do? Well, he goes on to say some more good things in here, and we're going to look at some of those now. So starting down, if we, if we continue down into chapter 7, verse 24, Paul says this. He says, What a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What a wretched man am I? Who is going to save him from his misery? Who is going to save us? from ours. Well, he goes on to say in verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Thanks be to God who saves us in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God who delivers you and who delivers me. He goes on to continue in verse 1 of chapter 8. He says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation that even when we find ourselves in the ruts that we have been hardwired into, there is no condemnation when we find ourselves landing in that lower cycle. There's no condemnation for those who believe in Jesus. Because the, the good part about that is that Jesus came and died 
so that we could be forgiven and set free. So that we could be set free from that condemnation. That we could be set free from unhealthy coping. That we could be set free from shame and isolation. And that we could be set free from believing the lies that we have believed for so long. To be free from the pull of that lower cycle. And free to stand in the truth. Free to live the abundant life that Jesus calls us to live. But we can't do it by accident, and we can't do it alone. Paul goes on to tell us in verse 5, he says this. He says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Do you see the pull into those different cycles? And then he goes on to say in 6, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Life in peace, that we don't have to stay in those lower cycles, that we can find life and peace outside of them. Science says that we can change. Science says that we can rewire our brains. And the really cool thing is, you guys, is that the Bible says it too. And so what if we invited and allowed the Spirit to work through us the spirit of life and peace. That when we practice some of these tools at our trigger point, that the spirit of life and peace can come in and integrate so beautifully with it. What would that look like? Well, do you remember last week we talked about the stop principle? And what the stop principle does is that it reminds us that at the point of the mental health trigger, we have to stop. And when we hit that stop button, we are giving our brains an opportunity to be able to be rewritten. Because we know that in that moment when we stop, we have one of two choices. We can choose and allow ourselves to kind of go into those ruts and that natural pathway that we've created. Or we can live and invite the power of the Spirit who is life and peace and allow him to help pull us out of those ruts and set us on a new path. And so... We're going we're gonna to practice something um, today. It's going to feel a little bit weird, so you're going to have to, like, do it with me. Um, or else I'm going to look really silly up here. And Pastor Jason said that you guys are going to be really good participants, and so you, you get to do it with me. And what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to practice another thing that will help our brains become or allow themselves to become rewired. And so what we are going to do is you are going to, while you're sitting, I'm going to do it standing. Um, so one, you can see, and two, I don't have a chair. But what you're going to do is you're going to cross your legs either direction. Not, I can't do that one because I'm unbalanced. <laughs> so whatever direction works for you, you're going to cross your legs. And then you're going to put your hands out like this, thumbs down. You're going to cross them. You're going to grab them. And you're going to come up. And it feels weird at first. And so if you need to practice it a couple times, you can. If it's easier for you, you can do this. You can have your hands folded and then just come in and squeeze, but they do need to be crossed. And what we're doing here is when we stop, when we find ourselves triggered and we stop for a second and you allow yourself to do this, the crossing combined with the pressure of the squeeze essentially starts to jump your brain's connections. And so you're crossing the right and the left hemisphere, which moves your brain out of the heightened emotional state you might find yourself in and pulls it more into the logic side. And so we're going to practice something, and we're going to start rewiring some of those hardwires. And so while the worship team comes up, 
We're going to stay in this position for just a second, and we're going to pray together. Because again, there's something really beautiful that happens when you invite the power of the Spirit to come in and begin to rewire what has been hardwired. And so let's, let's pray together. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us, Jesus. That when we believe in you and your spirit, that there is no condemnation, Lord. That we are free from these cycles that we find ourselves on over and over, Jesus. And so would you come? Would you send your spirit now? Would you even in these moments, Jesus, help us begin to see what is possible when we open ourselves up and allow you to work in and through us, Jesus? that your spirit can help us rewire what we've been hardwired to do. God, we need you so desperately. We can't do this alone, Lord. We know because we've tried over and over and over again. And yet we find ourselves, God, in the same ruts time and time again. So help us, Lord. We need you. We need you.